Good evening. If I, if I could have your attention, please. It's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm Evo Dollar, the uh, president of the Chicago Council uh, on Global Affairs, and I'm delighted to welcome the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Judith Roden, to Chicago, back to Chicago, I should say. Uh, tonight, she will share uh, her views about the major disruptive phenomena of the 21st century, urbanization, climate change, and globalization, and how we can build resilience uh, to deal with these and other disruptions that we will confront, that we confront today and are likely to confront in the future. And cities have been at the heart of this effort of building uh, resilience. And Dr. Roden has truly been a leading voice in the discussion uh, of this topic, not least through the 100 Resilience City Network that was created by the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, last month, the foundation added Chicago to this network, uh, which helps build uh, resilient strategies in cities and to deal with the crisis and challenges that we confront in the modern world. Chicago is one of the great global cities, not only in this nation, but indeed in the world, and which is why the Chicago Council is launching a major initiative on this very topic. We've received uh, very generous support from the McCormick Foundation, from the Chicago Community Trust, to examine the role of global cities like Chicago in driving the world economy and in the evolving nature of our international politics. And as you may know, uh, the Council and the Financial Times will host the Chicago Forum on Global Cities here in late May, a forum that will bring corporate and civic and cultural uh, and uh, education leaders from global cities around the world here to discuss the challenges that confront them uh, and their cities. Uh, we look forward to updating you on all of this as we launch this, formal, uh, this forum uh, later next month. But now we're kicking off 2015, our year of global cities, and we can't do it in any better way than asking Judith uh, Roden to, uh, to be our lead and opener. Uh, briefly, uh, you can see from the biography on your chairs, and I won't go through it, uh, all of the, uh, the uh, background of Dr. Roden, but you, as I mentioned, she is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. She was previously, previously the president of the University of Pennsylvania and the provost of Yale University. She's been named one of Forbes' world's 100 most powerful women, not just once, not just twice, but three times in a row. She is, of course, the author of The Resilience Dividend, Being Strong in a World Where Things Go Wrong, which, by the way, is available here for purchase and for signing immediately after this event. We are live casting this event. Uh, so uh, please uh, join that conversation on, in social media after you have silenced your phones. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Judith Roden. Good evening, and thanks again, Evo, for that very generous introduction, and to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for the invitation to speak with you tonight. Uh, I'm delighted to be here because it means I'm no longer in New York City. <laughs> the near blizzard that hit the East Coast was unprecedented in its disruption. It shut down our transit systems, it ca uh, caused roads and traffic to stop across three states, and it dump more than two feet of snow on some parts of New York. I guess what you in Chicago might have considered a light dusting. <laughs> but I come with renewed respect for your ability to weather these winter storms with good humor and humanity, uh, neither qualities on display at my local Whole Foods on the run up to this storm. <laughs> but that's not the only reason I feel such great admiration as president of the Rockefeller Foundation and as someone who's been passionate about cities from the perspective of both a social scientist and a university president um, in another great city, I owe a very large debt of gratitude to your city. As many of you know, our founder, John D. Rockefeller, contributed a hefty sum to establish the University of Chicago. He called it the best investment he ever made, which only hurts our feelings at the Rockefeller Foundation a little bit. <laughs> but indeed, with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, 
Scholars of the Chicago School change the way we think about cities in the modern day borrowing heavily from the field of biology and using the city of Chicago as their laboratory. These social scientists, including Ernest Burgess and Lewis Wirth, viewed cities as complex, interactive, ecological systems. They dismissed what they called armchair theorizing in favor of practical approaches. They researched and implemented in the streets of Chicago with a grit and a moxie that equaled the residents of the neighborhoods they were working in. They mined government data and then mapped it. These approaches are now the tenets of all modern public policy in the United States, but at the time they were extraordinary, revolutionary ideas. And perhaps most trailblazing about their work was their focus on social stability and the flip side on disruption. They looked at trends like crime and white flight and the development of slums and political corruption. At the time, these disruptors were labeled pessimists. They characterized urbanites as blasé, aloof, lacking kinship, among other unflattering adjectives. But in hindsight, of course, they're viewed as pioneers. And their work came to greatly shape how the Rockefeller Foundation, over the next several decades, supported community development, including a grant to a little-known community activist, Jane Jacobs, to write The Death and Life of Great American Cities. So as I stood with Mayor Emanuel earlier today to formally announce the selection of Chicago as one of the next cohort of Rockefeller's global 100 resilient cities, it felt to me as though we had come full circle. Once again, Chicago and Rockefeller are bringing an innovative partnership to better understand and to learn how to more effectively respond to the crises that cities around the world face, but this time in the 21st century. But there are some mighty differences between the challenges cities are facing now and those of a century ago. As Evo said, because of globalization, rapid urbanization, and climate change, these changes are coming faster and they're staying longer and they're becoming more and more expensive. Crisis is becoming the new normal. Indeed, not a week goes by that we don't see somewhere in the world blizzards or flooding, fires or cyber attacks, terrorism, civil unrest. And then, of course, there are the slower burning stresses that weaken a city's ability to confront these growing challenges, which are exacerbated, indeed, in times of crisis. Inequality, crime, air pollution, water shortage, failing infrastructure. But from the Great Fire to the Great Recession, Chicago, you've seen all of these in abundance. And Chicago isn't alone. Crisis may have become the new normal for every city, large and small, in every region of the world. Now, I know your mayor always puts Chicago first, but I hope he'll forgive me if I quote a New York mayor. Mike Bloomberg always said, in God we trust, everyone else should bring data. So <laughs> here are some key data points to consider. Globally, the number of reported disasters has grown exponentially since 1980, and the cost of these disasters is up 300%. In 2011 alone, $320 billion were spent on natural disasters worldwide. To put in perspective just how huge this number is, $320 billion would rank in the top 35 of all countries' GDPs. In other words, ranking higher than Singapore or Israel. Plain and simple, this is unsustainable. The global community, our key leaders and policymakers, simply cannot afford to continue business as usual. While these crises have stolen the headlines, there are other less visible but equally disturbing trends that many of you know well. Since the middle of the 19th century, the rate of sea level rise has been greater than the average rate for the previous 2,000 years combined. Think about this. Each hour, Louisiana loses about a football field's worth of land. That means that each day, the state loses 
nearly the accumulated acreage of all 32 NFL stadiums. Think of that as you watch the Super Bowl this weekend. Or consider that the average US company is attacked by hackers 17,000 times a year. And Verizon Enterprise Solutions in a recent survey showed that only 5% of all retailers could self-identify a breach. Think of that the next time you use your credit card. And this is true around the world. Last week I was in London where the Financial Times reported that 80% of large companies in the UK had some form of security breach in 2014, each one costing between 600,000 and about a million to pounds apiece. We don't know when the next crisis will happen or where, and they're not contained to one city or sector when they do occur. Because of globalization, vulnerability in one city ripples across all systems. The 2000 flooding in Bangkok, Thailand took down a third of the global technology supply chain. Health threats travel just as fast as economic ones. From the spread of measles in the Magic Kingdom to six states and counting, to the West African Ebola patients seeking treatments in emergency rooms in major cities around the world. But, and this is my fundamental point, not every disruption has to become a disaster. By building resilience, all cities and the individuals, the communities, the businesses and the natural systems that make up those cities can develop the capacity to bounce back from crisis to learn from it, and actually to revitalize because of it. The Rockefeller Foundation has invested more than a half a billion dollars in my 10 years in helping cities and communities of all kinds build their resilience, from post-Katrina New Orleans to rapidly urbanizing cities in Asia, pre and post Superstorm Sandy in the New York area, and now the 100 Resilient Cities Global Network. From this experience, we know that building resilience requires developing five characteristics, and these are important. First, they're aware of their vulnerabilities and their assets. They have both the willingness and the ability to assess, to take in new information and adjust to that information using robust monitoring and feedback loops. Second, all resilient systems are diverse and often redundant in the types of backups and alternatives they can access so that if one part of the system is challenged, it can rely easily and readily on another. Third, they're integrated in the way they share information, ensuring coordination across all components. The left hand knows what the right hand is doing and they're working together towards the same goals. Fourth, they're self-regulating, meaning that if one part of the system fails, the entity can de-link from it to keep the problem from spreading. This is the difference between safe failure and failing catastrophically. Finally, resilient entities are adaptive. They have the capacity to adjust to changing circumstances by developing new plans and taking on new actions, modifying past behaviors. The entity is flexible. In other words, it bends, not breaks. And these are exactly the capacities we must develop, whether they're, we are individual citizens, or leaders of cities, or businesses, or leaders in capitals around the world. As I mentioned this morning, I had the pleasure of introducing your mayor, who knows more about resilience than most, from <laughs> reinventing Bill Clinton as the comeback kid <laughs> to leading Chicago's stunning rebirth, he's demonstrated the resilience characteristics that I just described. Awareness, adaptability, integration, ability to draw in multiple sources of capacity, self-regulation. Well, four out of five aren't bad. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, we know that cities or companies or individuals who work to build these capacities thrive. Just look at Toyota. Before the Japanese earthquake, the company had put resilient strategies into place that embodied these characteristics quite intentionally. 
from more integrated planning to self-regulation opportunities among employees. When the earthquake hit, resilience action was part of the co company culture. Everyone knew what to do. It saved lives and helped restore the functioning of producers across their supply chain. It also produced remarkable innovation around new materials, new paints, new designs. Only two years later, Japan had regained its position as the number one automaker in the world. Even uh, Toyota had regained its position as the number one automaker in the world, even as Japan is still struggling to recover. Put another way, in the words of Winston Churchill and claimed by your mayor, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. But must we may wait for the next shock to galvanize our city, to galvanize our state or our country? The goal is to thrive, not just to survive. And to truly thrive, we must better assess our vulnerabilities and rebuild our capacities because not only our physical and our natural infrastructure is important, but building resilience means building our economic diversity and the social fabric of all our cities and our communities. And by doing so, we stand to gain at every part of the resilience building process. I call this the resilience dividend, and it is just that, a multiple return on a single investment. Consider this statistic. The US government spent almost $150 billion from fiscal years 11 to 13 on disaster relief alone, so a third of the global spend. To put that in context, it's more than 40 times larger than the current budget of the city of Chicago. That comes out to roughly $400 a household per year. Yet we know that a dollar spent on prevention saves an average of $4 in lower damages. Imagine what would change if we could spend that $400 per household on measures that actually made that household more resilient, rather than paying out in damages after the fact. What kinds of returns we could see beyond those in saved lives or property protected. For example, new kinds of jobs created or better infrastructure and greater community assets. That's the resilience dividend. Imagine the returns we would get if we took steps to screen all global development aid through a resilience building lens. To see how it works, let's just take an example from physical infrastructure investments. We have such a global opportunity here. 40% of the urban infrastructure that will exist in 35 years around the world has not yet been built. We have a choice. We can build it the right way or we can go horribly wrong. For example, there are many ways to build a bridge or a road, but only some of them use materials that have resilience characteristics from roadways built or repaired with available materials that absorb water more quickly or release it more slowly, to bridges now using 3D printed pilings that actually bend instead of breaking when the wave actions hit, or diversified transit options to give a region opportunities so that one blow doesn't take the whole system down, or a power grid you can build a, a city power grid today with smart grid technology that readily assesses and uses whatever source of energy is most available, thus reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. And with a smart switch in that grid, the power company is able to delink a piece of infrastructure if it's failing so that half a city doesn't plunge into darkness when one piece goes down, something that happened in lower Manhattan after Superstorm Sandy. The dividends can be achieved across all three phases of the resilience building process, readiness, recovery, and revitalization. It starts with good preparation and planning, and not just for the last crisis, but for any crisis. In my book, I tell the story of the Boston Marathon bombing. For a decade before, 
The city of Boston had been planning for any type of emergency event, from hurricanes to blizzards to terrorist attacks. They conducted complex, demanding preparatory exercises and simulations, and they used large crowd celebrations like Super Bowl championships to practice. This was coupled with tight coordination between multi-agency and multidisciplinary teams, including all their local service businesses, their media outlets, their first responders, and medical officials. And so 18 minutes after the explosion, all red tag patients, meaning those who were uh, most vulnerable, but had been, transplant, had been transported to Boston area hospitals, and nobody who made it to a hospital died. What's more, communication planning prevented the spread of digital rumors and fear-mongering, and critical systems were quickly restored. Chicago is actually the home to the nation's first public-private partnership for resilience, Chicago First, which was convened in the wake of the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, with the goal of better coordination among financial institutions and public agencies in case of a similar attack. Today, the wider effort of the Chicago Public-Private Partnership Task Force convenes a much broader group of stakeholders here, including building owners, leaders from the hospitality, tourism, and entertainment industries, healthcare providers, and public safety officials to protect the city's essential physical and economic infrastructure. San Francisco has deployed a similar model called its Lifelines Council, and recently it's included its growing sharing economy businesses in its planning because their business model is actually based on a resilience principle, the effective use of excess capacity. And just as Boston used large crowd celebrations to test and practice emergency responses, San Francisco uses Fleet Week as an opportunity for the Navy who come on shore to engage in preparedness exercises with their citizens, turning what was traditionally a week of bar crawls into a greater opportunity that also yields real benefits for the city of San Francisco in terms of greater citizen engagement and increased community cohesion. That's the resilience dividend. Now, while planning and readiness are critical, they can't always prevent bad things from happening. And when they do, recovery must not be based on the build it back mentality that has guided too many recovery efforts in the past. Instead, we must rebuild better. The concept actually drove the rebuild by design competition in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut after Superstorm Sandy. Rather than simply using federal recovery dollars to rebuild what was there before, which is a natural tendency for people to want, we helped HUD launch a competition, bringing together global and local design teams to develop proposals with the affected communities. For example, one uh, winning solution is a barrier stretching 10 miles to protect lower Manhattan from future flooding. This area of New York houses major centers of the local and national economic engines, Wall Street and, and the World Trade Center, with vibrant neighborhoods and the fastest growing residential market in the country. That's a lot of lives and a lot of assets worth protecting. What you might think of when you think of a flood barrier is quite an eyesore, and that's what we see in many places around the world. But resilience thinking was a game changer. Working with experts, each community envisioned spaces that would allow them to reap their own dividends from how a flood protection barrier was designed. Increased green space and places to gather were built in. New bike paths to ease traffic congestion, infrastructure that doubles as art, and markets that will bring economic development to underserved areas. That's the resilience dividend. How could we make more of this happen? In the United States, a first step would be to remove future constraints that get in the way of good resilience building. Many of these are federal constraints. For example, in 2011, Hurricane Irene washed out miles of roads and bridges in Vermont. 
When Ver Vermont rebuilt, it chose to upgrade its uh, culverts to prevent this from happening again. That decision made sense. But FEMA wouldn't reimburse Vermont because upgrading the culverts meant the state was violating FEMA's requirements of rebuilding to pre-flood standards. That doesn't make sense. By limiting post-disaster spending to only allow for restoring assets to pre-disaster conditions, how can you expect a better result when the next storm hits? So here's one specific change that could be made. Congress should remove the language from all disaster legislation, including the Stafford Act, that encourages this vicious cycle. We also need to find and implement better ways to live with water and wean ourselves off today's pipe, pave, and pump approach. Singapore solved for both too much and too little water in a single elegant solution. Its marina barrage was designed not only to prevent flooding, but to provide a freshwater catchment to the city nation that has been so dependent on Malaysia for its imported water. What's more, it added a green and natural infrastructure that embraces water, so it created new parklands with breathtaking views and recreational opportunities that didn't exist before. New housing and businesses flourished in the area. Again, three wins for one investment. Changes must also happen in the form of policy reform when dealing with water. Again, let's think about the post-Sandy period in the United States. Congress passed bills then to revise the National Flood Insurance Program. They authorized changing and upgrading the flood maps and phasing in risk-based premiums for policyholders whose houses are vulnerable to repetitive flooding. But these reforms are now stalled because many homeowners can either not, af either cannot afford the risk-based premiums or won't voluntarily purchase insurance before a disaster. They know that the federal government will recover it and pay for it anyway. Policymakers need to step back and understand the reality both of their current actions and also the reality of adding additional financial pressures for homeowners who really cannot afford it. At the same time, they need to embrace more innovative solutions, solutions being developed by the insurance and reinsurance market. Our current approach isn't working for anyone, not for the working families who can't afford flood insurance and are financially stressed, and our private sector markets are being completely distorted by federal actions. You could imagine a scenario where working families in flood-prone areas could be given a means-tested voucher to pay the difference between the current discounted premium and the real risk-based premium. We could also couple the means-tested voucher with mandatory house, uh, hazard mitigation and finance it with low-interest loans. So if a homeowner were given an affordable, new way, low interest loan, for example, to make resilience or mitigation modifications in their home, like raising all of the electrical or mechanical operations above the mandated flood heights, they would see a significant reduction in their insurance premiums. Easy ideas not being implemented. And this goes to my next point that new forms of adaptation and growth must begin in the recovery process. We've been talking about how we recover and not building back the same, but it is critical for the third phase, revitalization, that we think about the opportunity to adapt and grow as we recover. Perhaps nowhere have we seen revitalization more than in New Orleans a case study in the need for building resilience and the dividends it can generate. As the recovery unfolded, and it's now been 10 years since Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans used the opportunity to transform its public education system, to diversify its economy, and to re-energize its neighborhoods. Today, the city is a magnet for talent and for startups, and it's piloting innovative resilience planning projects to restore wetlands, bring down crime rates, and improve public health.
That's the resilience dividend, and we're seeing it all over the world. Christchurch, New Zealand is leveraging their process for rebuilding after two devastating earthquakes to build a more participatory democracy to engage all of their citizens. Medellin, Colombia, confronted decades of drug trafficking, crime, and homicide. The city underwent a, an incredible, amazing, actually, revitalization by building transit systems that link the poorest and most vulnerable communities to the economic and social core of the city running down the middle of the valley with the hills above. They did it by using a gondola system and a series of hillside escalators. Who would have thought that modes of transportation most commonly associated with fancy ski resorts and shopping malls could provide the connective tissue necessary to spur economic and social integration, real social cohesion that allowed the city to respond differently to disruption. They did, and the results are undeniable. Medellin was once known as the drug and murder capital of the world. It is now a vibrant city with a strong tourist economy, and the murder rate is down 90%. In Pune, India, they were able to leverage resilience building to revitalize their ability to attract private companies. The city made investments to make it more resilient in its transportation, its energy sector, and to intentionally and systematically better, better integrate government and citizens groups. As a result, with a very broad competition among Indian cities, Deutsche Bank chose Pune to be the location of a new and large operations center, creating tremendous number of new jobs over all the other cities in India that competed because they saw Pune as most resilient. Revitalization is not just a concept that applies to cities, but also to the businesses that provide jobs and economic opportunity on which our cities depend. We've seen it in businesses like Best Buy, reinventing and revitalizing themselves after they've been knocked for a loop. Best Buy was a small Minneapolis St. Paul company called Sound of Music. Its stores were wiped out by a tornado in 1981. They could have closed. Statistics show that 25% of all businesses never come back after a disaster. But instead, they threw out their old model, which was counters and high-pressure salesmen and white glove home delivery. They pitched tents and stacked all their inventory in the open and slashed prices down to rock bottom. Two years later, they rebranded as Best Buy with this new business model. And today, Best Buy is one of the largest electronics retailers in the world. That's the resilience dividend. But businesses have a much bigger opportunity than just shoring up their own resilience strategies. They play a critical role in contributing to the resilience of their communities as well. And in the 21st century, this may become a differentiating business imperative. According to a recent Economist survey, 90% of all business leaders globally acknowledge that they have a role to play in building at least climate resilience. And a full 75% of them think that they will, must look for cross-sector partnerships to address these challenges over the next five years. We already see some great examples globally. For example, Bavaria Brewery, which is owned by global beverage company SAB Miller and located in Bogota, Colombia, is one of South America's largest breweries. In the last few years, however, they found that the cost of water from the local utility was rising precipitously. They almost thought they couldn't afford it. The culprit, upstream dairy farmers were clearing land for their cows to graze because of climate change. Without the plant roots to hold back the soil along the riverbeds, sediment was flowing downstream, disrupting Bogota's water supply and driving up the cost for everyone. As I said, SAB Miller might easily have moved their plant to another location with a great potential loss for the economy of Bogota. But instead, they joined with the water utility and the nature conservancy 
to support the dairy farmers in adopting new practices. For example, they paid for higher producing cows, allowing the dairy farmers to keep smaller herds and pre prevent the destruction of vegetation along the riverbanks. Through this investment in watershed protection, the water utilities save $4 million a year, and SAB Miller, as well as local households, cut costs on their water purchases. But that wasn't all. With better practices, the dairy farmers increased their own efficiency, improved their own livelihoods, and the ecology and ecosystems of their river improved. Multiple wins for a single investment. That's the resilience dividend. While physical and economic and ecological resilience are incredibly important, we can't become fully resilient without also focusing on the social fabric that either knits us together or drives us apart. The importance of social resilience in a disaster situation was clear in the Chicago heat wave of 1995, which many of you remember killed 739 people. What was particularly important about the mortality rates, though, was while most seemed to fall along economic lines, three of the 10 neighborhoods with the lowest deaths had some of the city's highest poverty rates. Englewood and Auburn Grisham, Grisham however, had high, equally high poverty rates, but had two very, very different outcomes. Englewood saw 33 deaths per thousand while Auburn Grisham, by contrast, had only three deaths per 100,000. I said by thousand, I meant per 100,000. The difference, Auburn Grisham had sidewalks, it had stores, it had community organizations. People walked the streets and were active in community groups. Neighbors knew neighbors. They knew where to turn in times of crisis. Englewood was a different story. Its social cohesion had left along with the commercial retailers and half the population over the previous 30 years. As Eric Kleinenborg, who conducted this research, said, living in a neighborhood like Auburn Grisham is the rough equivalent to those families of having a working air conditioner in each room. It is stunning. A recent AP NORC poll that questioned more than 2,000 people who were deeply impacted by Superstorm Sandy echoed these same findings 20 years later. One third of respondents said that they reached out to nearby friends, neighbors, family for assistance, far more than those who said they turned to government for help. It's often true that your first responders are your friends and neighbors before the police and firefighters can get there. The poll also found that neighborhoods lacking in social cohesion, the bonds that bind neighbor to neighbor that cause neighbors to check on one another in times of stress are actually recovering more slowly than equally hard hit neighborhoods, neighborhoods with similar amounts of destruction but lacking in social cohesion. Building this social cohesion often starts with good planning that emphasizes community interactions. Both Melbourne, Australia and Copenhagen, Denmark measure the vibrancy of urban life. They measure the effectiveness of their green spaces as well as using traditional metrics such as economic growth or traffic congestion. But bringing these efforts beyond just urban revitalization to really translating into builder, building greater resilience is the responsibility of citizens as well, not just of governments. It's the responsibility of all of us. We will see whether or not or how the terrorist attacks in Paris ultimately contribute to the city's resilience or frankly detract from it. We have a good guide from the 2011 attacks in Norway, where a lone gunman killed 77 of his fellow countrymen, many of them teenagers, in a bombing in government buildings in Oslo and then opening fire on a summer camp on an island. Despite the unmistakable, unthinkable tragedy, people didn't let the anti-immigration, anti-Muslim ideas of the killer tear their communities apart. Rather, 
the recovery explicitly, intentionally, took the opportunity to weave immigration more generally and Muslim communities in particular into the story of the Norwegian identity. Tonight I've shared with you amazing examples of cities, of businesses, of communities that are rising to the challenges and unleashing, unleashing the opportunities of this, what we may call the resilience age. But it will take all of us working together across sectors, across communities, across ideologies to ensure that cities can avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. In these turbulent times, we actually have no other choice. Chicagoan Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world breaks everyone and afterward many are strong at the broken places. But with resilience thinking, we don't have to wait for the world to break us, to make our cities stronger, to build more inclusive communities and economies, to make us all safer. And just as you have for the last century, my time in Chicago and my work in this city convinces me that once again, Chicago will help lead the way. So thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Dr. Oden, thank you for those incredibly thought-provoking remarks. Uh, my name is John Mack. I'm Director of Public Programs at the Council. We'll now turn it out to the audience, as is our custom. Please raise your hand, identify yourself, and keep your question to a question, if at all possible. We'll go right up here in the front. You. Oh, there's a microphone coming. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'll take the minute. Have a drink. Thank you, Dr. Oden, for a great talk. Um, the mayor today gave a speech at the City Club regarding uh, our need to build infrastructure here, which you seem to echo in your remarks, the importance of you know, building a, sol a solid foundation. In terms of the soft skills and your observation, what are other things we should be looking for? Is it, you know, we hear a lot about income inequality. We hear a lot about sort of the decline of blue collar jobs where a guy with a high school education could raise a family. Subsequently, the, the family structure is broken down. Education is an issue in many parts of our city. What are, once we get beyond infrastructure, what are other things that we should be focusing on? Um, thank you for the question. As Chicago and all of the other uh, cities who've been selected for our global 100 Resilient Cities network get started in this process with us, they will actually go through an agenda setting workshop. And citizens, community leaders, government leaders, business leaders, uh, from all sectors will be invited to really think about the resilience challenges for your city, both the shocks, which we talked about, and the slower burning stresses, which you just mentioned. And the framework, we're not identifying the stress for the city, but we are using a common framework for all cities to identify their own stresses and shocks. Um, and that framework asks them to think about four categories. So the physical and natural infrastructure is one. The second is governance and leadership. The third is economic and social, uh, economic well-being, including diversity of, of the economy, but also inequality and the like. And the fourth category is social and physical well-being. And so they are forced through that prism, I mean forced positively, to really identify in all of these categories. And one of the things we've seen in the first cohort of cities, the first 33, is that many of the shocks and stresses that they wrote about in their application, they're not ending up ranking very high once they go through that process and they really start wishing to work on other things. San Francisco, for example, wrote about seismic threats as their complete focus, and by the time they were finished their agenda setting workshop, they were onto inequality and a variety of the issues that we feel in reading about some of the issues in San Francisco, but didn't come through in the application, and we see this all over the world. Chicago's going to have an amazing opportunity because these cities range from Medellin and Rio and whatever to 
uh, Mandalay and, and uh, Quito and Arusha. And so we have London, Paris, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, New York but we also have some of the poorest cities in the world and the most vulnerable in the first cohort. Um, we chose Ramallah, um, and it's been amazing to work with Ramallah. So they get a chief resilience officer in addition to other things, and just setting up this global network of chief resilience officers who are working in each of their cities to work on all these issues that you raised um, is creating a transformation in the global narrative around how these problems, um, both shocks and stresses, will be addressed. All right, next question. Oh, right here in the center. There's a the microphone coming. Thank you. Um, Judy, it's Scott Bernstein from CNT. Good to see you again. So it seems to me that in your excellent recounting of what needs to be done and going beyond just recovery and not returning to pre-disaster um, conditions, it's going to take concerted public and private effort together. We did a, some work with the insurers here in town and found that most of the flooding that was occurring was not in the floodplain. Most of the, we, we used their, their claims data and so the FEMA maps were telling people to direct investment in one direction, and the, and the claims were being paid on someplace else. But the government systems that we've got still have us focused in the, in, in the wrong way. And a similar problem when we looked at where foreclosures were happening, the models were predicting one thing, but they were actually happening faster at one point in the suburbs than any place else around, around here. So uh, sort of a self-styled government internal consultative process isn't going to discover those new findings and new knowledge. Uh, you know, is there a way that we can interface with this system to sort of uh, disrupt the way people usually think about this to take new findings into account? Well, you've raised two very compelling examples, and so the next phase of the, just to give one example of the 100 Resilient Cities process, is that each city then works with developing a strategy, and there they are working with technical experts um, based on the identification from a broader group of constituents, and then they get access to a platform of pretty extraordinary goods and services from new kinds of big data analytics to very technical um, uh, government mapping of risks uh, to um, new forms of catastrophe insurance to new forms of municipal financing that all of these cities will have access to. So we're integrating the technical expertise and, and the opportunities. Um, the insurance example you raised and also the foreclosure example is just in a way making the point that I was trying to make, which is we need policy reforms that integrate both the best knowledge but also allow the private sector to operate effectively where it is willing and eager to take over. Um, FEMA is now in hoc tens of billions of dollars to the federal government for covering all of the disasters since the mid 80s because they've been increasing at such an accelerating rate. Before that, the payments actually did cover um, the payouts, but that hasn't been the case for a long period of time. And so why do we want our government to be sort of lurching from crisis to crisis when there are new models, new models of public-private partnership, new models of forecasting and prediction that we're way behind in our payout and our building strategies. Our developers need to be part of this solution, our private developers as well as the public developments. So it is an integration of all of this is a resilience building characteristic. So it's absolutely essential. All right, right here in the center again, a little further up. Doctor, why would you say that when it comes to issues towards making things better, why would you say that there's been issues to even retrofading something as simple as a sprinkler system into older buildings? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Why You've don't we put talked sprinkler a, systems in? about 
you mentioned a bit about prevention, but why has there been an awful lot of resistance to, for example, say, putting in a sprinkler system in an older building? Well, I, I don't know specifically about who's resisting and, and the buildings that you're talking about. We see in many places in the United States and certainly around the world, um, these kinds of retrofits going on uh, with the public voting to tax themselves to make the investment because they recognize the importance of that. So um, you may have examples where that isn't the case, but that only in a way continues to make the point that if we start with the resilience framework, we will make those investments because we're not just investing against a future potential loss, we're investing to make something work better in the good times. And that is what this is really all about. That is, in these times of, of really making, I think, appropriate decisions about a time of limited resources where we should be investing, why not look for th more bangs for every buck? That's something people of both political parties ought to be able to agree upon. Um, and it pays off in the good times, as well as uh, enabling greater protection when something does hit. That's what this is really all about. And it's as true for a building, as it is for a city, as it is, frankly, for a person. When you think about your own lives and how you're thinking about what you need to do for yourself. Okay, we'll go right here, um, about the fourth row back. Hi, Dr. Roden, um, Antoinette Gavin. Um, acknowledging that prevention is clearly the, the flagship and what the gold standard of what you'd like to do, you reference the need to take advantage of recovery. And after a crisis, are there specific things to consider, things to do when you're trying to trade off right after a crisis the need to get people back to normal, so to speak, but then introduce these new concepts? Could you share some of your thoughts and experiences there? Um, some of you know I'm a psychologist by training, and so I, I understand fundamentally the human desire to get things back to normal as quickly as possible, and, and it's very visceral and deep. It may not be possible to restore things the way they were, and I think the work in the recovery needs to build that narrative by creating a vision of what could be better. That's why I use the Rebuild by Design competition, um, because in working with the most afflicted communities, those that had the most motivation to get it done quickly and rebuild the same, and energizing them to rethink about what could be better and how things could be different if money were expended, enabled them to really not push so hard to build it back the same, and to imagine a better outcome for themselves. So as I said in, the, in that uh, flood barrier, it's called the Big U design, um, the, city is, uh, the citizens are getting all kinds of things they've wanted and been nagging the city for for years and not gotten, like better lighting and outdoor markets and new kinds of open spaces and the like, all built into one solution. We saw, and this it goes to the flood insurance, um, 900 families took a buyout. Uh, Staten Island and northern New Jersey families took a buyout after Sandy um, because they were so deeply damaged and they were so clearly in the floodplains. Now that's a very hard thing for a family to do, particularly in these communities where they're close-knit and many of them have been together not only for years but for generations. And so working with them to move whole blocks together, to move friendship patterns together. And then if you got, if you agreed to move, you got your pre-flood pre cost of your house. If you moved in a network from your street, your friendship group, your whatever, you got double your pre-flood buyout price. So a little behavioral economics and a good outcome at the other end 
um, allowed people to envision a better future. All right, we can go right here in the center. Thank you, Dr. Roden. My name is Althea. I'm a threat and response management uh, master's student uh, at the University of Chicago. And you spoke a lot in terms of resilience efforts about social cohesion and the importance of that. I know there's an emerging framework for community resilience. And my question, I study a lot um, on FEMA's end about mitigation efforts. So for me, it's how do you prioritize this need for social cohesion and community resilience, uh, where would you put the focus there, or would you put it in mitigation efforts for critical infrastructure, like ramping up you know, new building codes and the like? I wouldn't make a choice. Right, um, but, that's you know, the money. point I'm trying to make. I don't think that it can be either or. We have so many compelling examples in which it's a, it's a foolish choice, and it doesn't um, yield positive outcomes in the end. So my point over and over again is if you think about all four domains that I outlined, how to improve leadership and governance, how to improve social cohesion, how to improve physical uh, infrastructure and natural systems, natural infrastructure, which is increasingly important you can design solutions that can accomplish more than one thing. And in these days of scarcer resources, we must, we must do that. All right, we'll come right back here in the third row. Good evening. Hi. I wanted to address um, piggybacking off of two of the prior questions some of the both ladies addressed with regards to the end process of confronting a disaster and building the social cohesion or the social capital. If we can assume building social capital, to take the term from Robert Putnam's work, Bowling Alone, how can we build social capital to create a, a streamlined approach to assessing threat and risk assessment. I can assume that in the one, your 100 cities initiative, cultural barriers and sectoral barriers, barriers have influenced how individuals and cities collectively assess threat and how that threat is carried forth into effectuating salient public policy. Um, how does your framework and the methodologies associated with your framework help us to really redefine, recast what we have known the conventional definition of threat to be, and how can we utilize this new definition of threat and build it into the resilience framework? Not so much at the end, but towards the beginning, where social capital must be present in order to really come to fruition. Um, the lack of social capital is itself a threat. And so as cities, as leaders, as institutions are doing their risk assessment, they will fall short if they only do it on the kinds of structural, old model processes. So we're working to reframe how risk assessment is done in these hundred cities. We're working to reframe how planning is done and how planning is thought about um, and taught in, in universities going forward. And we're working to evolve towards a more participatory process. One of the things that we learned early, and this was in New Orleans, um, everybody knew the threat. Uh, and everybody knew that the levees were breachable. So it wasn't a failure of risk assessment. New Orleans failed because it lacked social and economic capital when it flooded. And it was decades of lack of social cohesion that really breached in some fundamental way. Um, the water was only the trigger. So as cities and institutions start to assess risk, they must and they will look at things other than the kind of physical threats that have been, or, or geopolitical threats. You know, I think about water. So this was the first year um, in the 10 years that the World Economic Forum does their global risk assessment 
um, which assesses the global leaders who participate uh, at Davos. And they judge what the most fundamental risks are globally and those that they think will have the most impact. And this year, the number one impact risk is water. Um, lack of fresh water, flooding, everything about too much and too little water. And most of those who were in attendance confessed that they haven't thought about it. But Ram said today when he addressed a group earlier that when he was in the White House, they would have maps. And you could literally map water uh, risk, so lack of fresh water around the world and where the greatest sources of geopolitical conflict were. So we've got to be thinking about the intersection and the juxtaposition of all of these when we're building our assessments. So the natural, the geopolitical, the social, welcome to the 21st century. All right, we had a question here in the fourth row. How will the resilience model help prevent corruption and in infrastructure contracting so we have uh, <laughs> uh, the new materials that are resilient put into these new structures? Um, <laughs> that's a, a, a hard question. So um, we're hoping that as cities do new kinds of contracting RFPs, we hope that um, we will see, and we are seeing in a lot of the contractors, real leadership in thinking about resilience. So we have several partners, global partners that we've worked with who are contractor teams, design engineers um, who are working all over the world, uh, who are really thinking in, in very creative ways. Look, there's corruption in anything, and so um, how we approach this is probably no different than, than anything else, but getting the kinds of models, at least, that can set the right framework is a first step. Um, right over here. Thank you, Dr. Roden. Joyce Coffey with the Global Adaptation Index, uh, and especially thank you for the global leadership you show on resilience. So you make a very compelling case for the need for measurement and data. How do we compel governments to gather and share their data if, in fact, it is so important for resilience? Is there, in fact, a resilience dividend on that data gathering? Um, well, we want governments to see the value in it themselves, and so we're in the midst of uh, a request by the government of Vietnam. We started working in Vietnam early in our um, Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network, and. Um, in their view, had very significant success in, in three of their major cities. And so they've asked us to work with them to use this resilience index now to evaluate all 97 of the cities in Vietnam, and then they want to frame urban and national policy around that. Our condition for working with them in doing that is that they would share the data, that we would share the model and they would share the data so that we begin to collect this global database. You know, somebody said to me, oh, you have this index, you could run a competition, you know, and, and, and make each five years or whatever, you could have all of these cities or countries compete with each other over who's most resilient. Well, yeah but I'd rather have them cooperate by sharing data and sharing best practices and really building a global community. If we believe in these issues of, of the challenge as well as the opportunity of globalization, it's in all of our interests for every city to succeed. Um, and we've got to really collaborate by sharing data openly um, and transparency is, is another part of resilience because you're getting feedback loops and real-time information and real-time monitoring. You know, we had 800 cities around the world apply so far for this 100 resilient cities. We've only selected 70. We have one more cohort. Some of the cities that were applying, we, 17 languages, I couldn't even imagine how they could have heard of this. So it is really striking a global chord 
in a way that, again, this isn't the solution to every world problem. I'm not, I'm not saying it is. But I do think that there's some fundamental chord that is making cities say, we want to understand this, we want to be part of it. Um, there's a new way of thinking about what we do and how we do it. And it will come from the bottom up, both from cities to their countries and from the citizens to their governments. So we don't accept a city's application that doesn't have multiple sectors making the application together. This is not about what your government can or should do for you. This is about what we and all sectors need to do together. We have time for just one or two more. Let's go right in the center over here. To your left. Uh, hi, Sharon Lear, philanthropy consultant. I was con uh, very interested in how you are going to benchmark the opportunity as the cities begin to roll together. And then also, is there a timetable set for these, this project? Though it is, of course, very far reaching, you have many cultural differences, many different things to overcome. Um, how is that going to be addressed? Um, in, in the four domains that I mentioned that frame the first workshop, there are micro indicators of where the city is in those domains, and then we will monitor in each city how that changes over time. So we'll have a huge data set and a huge data analytics capacity, and it's why we're excited to use big data analytics, not only as a framework for cities to use and integrate their own data, but also for us to integrate data across these diverse interventions um, that many of the cities will be undertaking often in the developing world for the first time. So we will have quite a rich data set. All right. Um, I actually and have... we will make it available to scholars. <laughs> um, you talked about infrastructure. Um, what about the digital infrastructure? What about cyber attacks? The council is about to do a big cyber series. I remember the great blackout of 2002. I was eating dinner, lights went out, they went out for days. So there's the cyber attack side of it, then there's also the linked digital infrastructure. Um, absolutely, so on this platform um, for the cities, Microsoft has just put their new cyber solution, which is uh, giving them the opportunity to really show uh, the spread of an attack as it's actually occurring and our cities will have access to that. So we're then looking at what kinds of interventions uh, really could be put in place. When you get into the cyber and the digital, it raises concerns about privacy. And so, and those concerns differ from city to city and country to country across the globe. So we're mindful of how that will unfold and that's part of, I think, the excitement and the learning process here, but you heard the cyber data that I quoted. Right. So this is an escalating issue, um, and uh, it will affect the resilience of the populations of, of uh, many of the cities in which we're working. Um, we are out of time now. The resilience dividend is for sale in the back, and Dr. Roden will sign it directly afterward. Please join me in thanking you for your comments tonight. Thank you tonight. again.